Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 310. Today is Sunday the 13th of January 2019. And just before introducing my guest for this week, a quick announcement that my new book is just published and available as a paperback or ebook on Amazon. It's called Artificial Empathy, Putting Heart into Business and Artificial Intelligence. Hope you take a look. So today's guest is Gian Piero Petrilleri, who's a leading professor of management at INSEAD with a focus on leadership and learning. In this conversation with Gian Piero, we look at the most important qualities of leaders in today's business environment. As Gian Piero says, leaders need to be both engineer and novelist. We also discuss the importance and role of ethics, the place of politics in business, and leadership of brands in a multinational conglomerate organization. A most stimulating interview that touches on some very important topics. Welcome to the Minter Dialogue podcast, where we discuss branding and all things digital. I am Minter Dial, your host, and you'll find the show notes on my eponymous site, MinterDial.com. Enjoy the show. Gian Pero Petrieri, it's great to have you on the show. I've been dying to have you on ever since we had that marvelous experience uh, at the INSEAD reunion where you absolutely wowed us, uh, intrigued us, and titillated us on this notion of, of leadership in today's crazy world. So Gianpiero, in your own world, tell us, um, how, how would you describe yourself? Uh, I'm a management professor who trained as a psychiatrist and um, was interested in the way groups can make us thrive or can drive us crazy. And um, eventually through the, you know, through the vagaries of, modern careers ended up um, studying how people uh, find a sense of self uh, pursuing this, this uh, idea or illusion of uh, becoming a leader and uh, working at a business school, very interested in leadership and learning. Um, and that's, uh, that's who I am. Well, we, we share this experience of INSEAD and at the reunion, you talked about this notion of leaders today being needing to be novelist and engineer. And I, of course, I wrote up a blog post about how much this impacted me or made me think as a writer myself. How do you describe the place of humanities as an academic study, if you will, for leaders? And, and to what extent should leaders today be looking for people with humanities backgrounds? Yeah, I think... I think you have to think of the humanities as a metaphor for a serious, sustained concern for what makes us um, what makes us tick, what um, makes us relate um, to each other in a in, in a civilized way, if you want, and what makes um, and what makes societies function. So you know the humanities tend to investigate the question of what makes us different from. Um, our relatives uh, in in the great apes family um <laughs> and uh, you know and what keeps us um, getting along instead of killing each other what um, makes a distribution of resources in a society fair and um, unfair how should we how should we get organized and and why and and i think you know, you hear a lot these days this idea that um, leaders need the humanities. And I think it's a way of saying that leaders need to continue taking this question seriously in, um, in their work. That um, just because something works, just because something is efficient, doesn't mean that it should exist or that it's particularly useful or effective. I think it's a call for leaders to have um, a moral orientation as well as a, um, you know, as a as an economic and functional orientation. But I also want to say I don't think it's anything new. Um, I mean, as you said in your um, in your question, I think forever leaders have had to um, demonstrate two kinds of performance if they wanted their leadership to last. Their um, technical performance, the fact that they could achieve certain results, especially if they had promised to achieve certain results, 
um, but also their cultural performance, which is um, their ability to embody certain values that um, um, their people, their community hold dear. If you can't achieve the results you promised to achieve, or if you can't embody the values um, your community hold dear, it's, um, it's hard to be a leader. And you've got to do both at the same time. That's why I often say you cannot be alpha leader. Um, you, you're not a leader at all. In the same way that you can't be alpha human. Uh, I mean, what distinguishes a human from a machine is that it, uh, it's, um, the, the quality of its um, existence can be simply reduced to whether it achieves what it was built to achieve. Um, humans uh, want different things at the same time, conflicting things at the same time, um, and uh, and I think those contradictions um, make us human in the same way that being able to look at both sides of um, performance makes someone a leader. In what you say, there's maybe an implicit acceptance of imperfection. Um, Yes, um, and I, I don't know, I don't even know whether, whether, whether imperfection is, um, I don't even know even what, what perfection would look for a human or, um, or for a society other than an illusion. Um, we're certainly perfectible, <laughs> but I don't know if we're ever perfect, uh, and if we believe we are, I think it's when trouble, very serious trouble starts. You mentioned this notion of, of ethics and our ability to stand for something. In today's world, would you not say that that is more true than in the past? Or do you believe it's always been as true? I think, I think all leadership is ethical in, in that it... Um, there's always an ideology under underlying it. You know, there's always an ideology under, you know, there's always an idea about um, who we are and who we should be and why that's good for us. The question is, um, who us is? Um, so I think in a world in which um, different groups come into closer contact more and more often, either because of mobility or because of technology, then uh, the the question of who are we, who are we, or who is we, um, becomes much more frequent and much more uh, difficult to answer. So, in that respect, yes, that's maybe more true today. But I don't think it's um, I don't think you could say that um, leadership in the past didn't have an ethical dimension. It's just that ethical dimension was much less problematic because at least for a certain group and at a certain period of time, um, people might have had a consensus about what was right and wrong, or at least might have had to pretend to have a consensus about what was right or wrong. And then usually the people who embodied that idea of right would be picked as leaders. Um, I think it's a lot more, um, there's a lot more negotiation that needs to happen once, uh, once organizations or societies become um, more fluid and diverse. Well, there's also an element of transparency because of the magnifying glass or maybe the microscope that the internet allows for yeah. things to reveal themselves and then for the employees, much less the consumers, to be able to shout about it and, and mag magnify their discontent. Yeah, absolutely, or their fanaticism. I think it's... Um, it's um, it's it's a time in which it's um, much easier to find people who are enthusiastic about your point of view and much easier to express your disappointment. Um, so, so one of the things you 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 uh, what, what is, is definitely interests me is is the notion of expressing yourself as a leader and. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're making decisions. There may be your culture. I, I look at specifically the area of multinationals and the challenge of having a, a series of multiple brands underneath you, because each brand by themselves 
ought to have its own set of values and territory and yeah. and key performance indicators and and specific um, in, you know individual USPs. How does a CEO then incorporate or oversee that umbrella of brands while allowing the brands to be different? Well, maybe shifting their view of what is or her leadership needs to provide. I mean, very often we still think of leaders as having to provide a vision first and foremost, and therefore that that perspective already creates a conflict because how do you provide a singular, consistent vision when your organization um, includes um, entities who benefit from having their own distinct identities, right? Mm -hmm. And so your singular vision threatens their distinctiveness. So one way to deal with it is to actually changing your perspective from having to provide a singular vision to thinking of your job as a leader as having to provide a hospitable space, having to provide a space in which more than one story of um, equal citizenship and equal voice. And by the way, I think this is uh, true in a lot of um, in a lot of uh, struggles with leaders today, which is uh, we keep thinking of leadership as the provision of a vision. And that works very, very well when there's only one single ideology, one single story, one single entity to look after. When homogeneity is the name of the game, then um, the visionary is a great um, form of leadership. But when you have multiplicity, when you have um, more than one voice, more than one identity, more than one story, um, what's uh, the challenge that leaders need to tackle is not to um, give voice and embody that one single story and amplify it uh, for the world to see. The challenge that, need, that leaders need to tackle is how do you um, create a space where more than one story can come together and see each other, learn from each other and, and grow. Um, and, uh, and I think, uh, you know, this is where I think leaders need to be less uh, visionary and um, more connectors this, um, these days. And so in, um, in many ways, I would think if I were that CEO, my question would be not like what's the overarching story, but what's the, what's the space in which these different entities can um, um, can thrive. I love it. So, if if you were then a headhunter and and you you're running, let's say, a company like Procter and Gamble, would that mean that you should not be hiring someone like Steve Jobs? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Into Definitely. Because you wouldn't you wouldn't want to. You see, our traditional portraits of leadership are all over indexed on consistency, on that single-minded focus on one vision to the point of personal obsession, right? That the Steve Jobs example, that person that, you know, till the last minute um, embodies the magic of one um, simple yet overarching vision. But if you're running a, an organization in which you're serious about... Um, multiplicity in which you're serious about diversity, in which you're serious about inclusiveness, what you need is leaders that are actually very comfortable with inconsistency, with um, not who's, um, who, and you need to focus less on their competence than on their capacity, not what they can manage, but actually what they can handle. Uh, and it's very hard for a leader to match their multiplicity in their external environment if they don't have a certain amount of multiplicity in their internal environment. And by the way, this is the idea that many multinationals apply when they send their high potentials across different functions and across different geographies because you want to make sure that once they get to those top positions, they can actually find within themselves a piece, of, um, a piece that mirrors, that resonates with the different parts of the organization they need to lead. Um, and if they can't, then those parts of the organization will feel unseen, unrepresented, and alienated. 
my observation for having worked in a large organization which shared lots of individuals is that you tend to replicate what you are successful at. So if you get promoted from one company to another, well, what I did there was what I, I knew how to do and I did it well and I was recognized for that. I get promoted. Absolutely. Then typically what I do is I reproduce that. And then the challenge becomes how do you make different cultures underneath that? Because if I was on one brand now, I'm on another brand doing the same thing. Well, aren't I just harmonizing the brands? Yes. Yes, that's that's the challenge of change um, in any case. I mean, the human brain is a great generalizer. Whatever works, we retain. Whatever doesn't work, we dismiss. We are not um, amazing contextualizers. Uh, and, and there are good reasons for that. I mean, there's evolutionary advantages. But it's... Um, it's very useful to realize that, and it's also important to recognize that in order to transcend that natural, that natural ability to continue doing what has worked, which by the way, it's not, you know, it's got its advantages, um, we need to be curious and get help. Another, uh, sorry, another area, Jean-Pierre, that you, you talked about and you talk a lot about is the notion of trust. Yeah. Without trust, there is nothing. What I wanted to throw out was... Every asset and leader. <laughs> if you have trust, every other asset accrues to you. If you have every other asset but no trust, people will get at you anyway. So in, in today's world, uh, maybe we can start off with how has trust changed uh, materially in, 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 in the impact of this new technology and the new thing. But the one thing I wanted to throw out there was uh, how has politics potentially changed the way businesses govern themselves and the creation of trust um what do you mean by that well let's say that there's a divisiveness that reigns and it sort of has a way of seeping into our personal lives i believe that politics and let's say issues of the far right and far left are impacting every way we operate including the way governance is done the way even the stock market is now changing with their with um, funds that are looking at ESG and, and corporate uh, sustainable development. It, it's, it seems that the, the, the world's shifting and what people might have trusted in the past has has been changing. I mean, I, th I think that's, I think there's generally been a trend toward increasing towards an erosion of trust. And um, you know, people put it down. There's, there's been a lot of studies that put it down to different reasons. One is the fact that um, so-called leaders tend to accrue much more benefits than uh, than everyone else. In which case, it's not really leadership, is it? It's uh, it's it's predatory behavior. If you benefit only yourself and people close to you, and everyone else pays um, pays the price. Another is that. Um, there is a lot more opportunities to take refuge in uh, bubbles of people who share your ideas and beliefs. And when your ideas and beliefs get reinforced, very often you end up not just feeling comfort, but also feeling mistrust of people who don't share your ideas and beliefs. So there's this idea of increasing tribalism in, um, you know, in the in the public and and in the private sphere. Um, and uh, and certainly that goes with um, with a reduction of trust, uh, especially with a reduction of trust in uh, people who don't seem to be similar to us, or at least who don't seem to uh, to share our our cares and our and our concerns. Now, um, as to the question of politics. Um, I think business has always been, in a way or other, political. You know, in um, in many ways, it's. But for a long time, it was um, possible or acceptable to claim it wasn't to say, well, this is not, um, you know, it's not a personal political statement, just business. It's become a lot more difficult not to see the implications of the things that we do, uh, and so. I think, for example, you, you see it in the rise of, um, of CEOs who speak up about political issues. At the same time, I think it's the byproduct of the fact that um, business has infiltrated um, 
parts of society that used to be considered um, the province of politics, of government, or um, of the professions of um, religion. You know, in I think in the in the lecture you attended, I talked about how you can look at um, you can look at social struggle as the struggle between, um, in some way, spiritual or religious institutions and political mm-hmm. institutions and um, economic institutions. That's been the case through history. And when an institution becomes central to the social fabric, when it claims that it provides, it caters to most of um, our needs, then people start have, raising their expectation. They no longer expect their leaders to make the organization work. They may, they expect their leaders to make society function. And what's happening with um, with the trust deficit, uh, to me, is that as an organization, as a business, you can't come in and saying, well, we'll help provide people meaning, we have a positive social impact, we'll, um, we'll also provide economic value, which is, which is promising a lot. And then... Um, organizing yourself and measuring yourself on a pure logic of effectiveness because that what you have is a fundamental um, it's not a misalignment it, it's um, it, it's a misalignment that's it's not just a misalignment it's a misalignment that very quickly becomes a hypocrisy that very, that very quickly codes as you're saying one thing and then you're doing another cognitive um, dissonance you know what when I listen to you, I think of this notion of tribalism. And on the other hand, you have on the one hand, oh, we have to be open, diverse to everybody. Look how great we are for everyone. But as soon as we're trying to please everyone, we are and effectively not creating an identity. We're, we're nothing. I, mean, I think having a clear identity doesn't mean to be tribal. I think we need to make a very, uh, you know, tribalism is not the way to have a clear identity. Tribalism becomes the way to have a clear identity when we're very anxious. Because you can have a very clear and very strong identity that is not predicated on uh, demonizing and dehumanizing those who have a different one. So instead of using the word tribalism, community, because... Uh, you know, tribalism comes with the sort of a negative warfaring type of connotation, whereas community so. doesn't. Absolutely, and I think there are two kinds of communities: there are tribal communities, and there are um, and there are civilized communities. What's the difference between the two is that a tribe offers you safety in exchange for allegiance, and um, a civilization offers you, um, you know, offers you in exchange for contribution. A tribe tends to want to um, conquer, a civilization tends to um, invite. And, you know, if you look throughout history, the pendulum has always won between uh, our tribal and our, you know, and our civilized impulse ever since, uh, you know, Freud wrote about it in the in the 1930s and people have looked at this um, from every other angle but the moment we become actually the moment we become anxious about our identity that's the moment in which our communities become tribal become insular in which we think we are um, we are more human than those other people and the moment in which we become more secure in our identity is the moment in which our communities actually become civilized in which we say um, Oh, that's who we are. But I'm curious about who you are and um, what are you. And see, I think that's where um, that's where learning makes a big difference. I think you know, for me, um, the purpose of education is um, to take our tribal instinct and uh, and replace it with um, with curiosity, because at the end of the day, it's very easy to be kind and trust and trusting of those who are similar to you. What's harder is to be kind and trusting of those who are different from you. And unless you have that capacity, your community cannot call itself civilized. It's just a tribe. Just to finish then, jean this notion of trust in, in today's world, I have my observation has been that trust is really hardened once you've actually been through tough times. If you've lost together, if you if you and I know how to fight and and say it out together, that is an indication and the road to real long term trust. 
because we know how to go through the bad times. Whereas, let's say, curiosity, being kind, being open are much more positive, benevolent. But it does strike me that we need to allow for more toughness in, in this world in order to achieve greater trust. Well, I mean, what you're describing is not just toughness, it's toughness and sticking togetherness, you could say. And um, But if there is a society in which you see that there is, um, that there are tough periods, and in those periods, some people seem to benefit and others don't, some people um, reap the rewards and others pay the price, then what you have is a recipe for mistrust, which is, I think, what happens in a lot of places these days. And so if, but if a community is going, yeah, definitely, absolutely, I think that the best kind of trust, the best kind of hope is the one that results from going through a rough patch and realizing that you can actually, um, you know, get through on the other side. You know, that's, um, that gives you a sense of hope, what I call resilient hope, a hope that's not based on illusions, but it's based on a realistic sense that you know we can get through this or I can get through this um, and that requires that requires a sense that we got through this together and then you build trust yeah absolutely I would agree with that but if you have a difficult period and then it turns out that we are not really getting through it together actually I'm getting through it much more easily than you are then that's likely going to build mistrust not trust my daughter put it to me trust papa comes through experience. Trust you build over time. You don't just get it. You don't get it. You need to earn it. So lessons, lessons learned from my daughter. So Jampiro, I know I need to let you go. Time is of the essence. What's the best way for someone to read your best writings and whether it's HBR or follow you or get in touch with you if they want to know more? www.gpetriglieri.com. I have got a website, all my writing, all the links to my work are all there. And uh, that would be G P E T R I G L I E R I, and uh, you know that's also has uh, all my contact information, social media, and whatnot. Well, Jean-Pierre, uh, I think you're an exceptional leader uh, in the position you take, the way you you are able to at the one hand be in real life and and engage people in the way you you teach but also being online and the way you write. And uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please like the handy Facebook button. Or better yet, head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. But first, relax to Josh Sachs's finger paint. Oh, fill me with all your colors any different way to rid me of the gray.
with all your favorite shades. 